inspiration, this Leviathan of meditation set to me. Welcome aboard the Nautilus, where we talk about all things sea life. And we try not to get too off topic talking about the things that remind us of the sea life we're talking about. Hey everybody, this is Fiona. And this is Paul. <laughs> we're mixing it up this week. We're introducing each other. Um, what do you have today? Um, do, you, I... do you have a strong feeling about going now? Or later? I have a strong feeling about going second. Okay, I'll start. You start. Yeah. I feel like mine has probably less to say about it because it's mine's very... a bit emotional. I, I'm going to be in a. Ah, <sighs> oh, he's gazing out the window. It's, it's in a far off eating? place. I know it's because I have very conflicting <sighs> parts inside of me that are pulling in different directions. It makes sense for two people who love sea animals and also love all seafood. Yeah, we'll it's get okay. into that. It's it's good to have emotionally complex lives. It's good to be challenged. It's good it's to be... It's good to, um, you know, recognize that, like, your comfort levels um, may be bordering on decadence. Mm. And that we need to... And bad environmental practices, I'm we sure. We need to revisit them and revise them. And, Stop um, eating avocados and fish. Be revulsed <laughs> a little bit. We should be living on deer. Yeah. As Pennsylvanians... There's plenty of deer. Oh, deer. There's plenty of deer and carrots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His venison stew all the time. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, I did the marine flatworm, which is an animal... <laughs> yeah, I know. It's sexier than you think it is. I never thought it wasn't sexy. Well, I don't even know if most people have an image of what this is yet. I had a mental image of it swimming, and I... It was like, I want to do that animal, but I couldn't figure out what it was even called. And I was Googling, like, do you remember some of the things I Googled? He was with me. I was like, animal that looks like a floppy rug and swims. <laughs> a circle rug. <laughs> yeah, a circle rug. Anyway, all I got was uh, it, advertisements for, like, bath mats with octopuses Octopuses, on them. <laughs> yeah. And Brown then finally, yeah, finally, I typed in something. I forget what I ended up typing in. I typed in, like, flat marine swim and i got the flatworm um this animal i have seen it in uh like generic coral reef footage that shows up in those documentaries as far as i remember like all the planet earth and everything like no one had ever talked about it um but it's this amazing well type in flatworm if you're wondering what i'm talking about but it's this totally flexible flat circular thing that has like roughly frilly edges and it kind of flops around, like flops swims around the water like it, like it looks like yeah it undulates yeah like it looks like if you had like a very very flexible not like a rug like a dense rug but like just like a textile that yeah. was a circle and then it and then it had to swim right 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 <laughs> and it kind of ripples with the body yeah the whole thing ripples and they're an overwhelming array of colors it's kind of bewildering i uh i i'm still not sure how much that has to do with uh well you know anything necessarily other well i know what why they're color but i don't know what the array of colors comes from if so, they're all different species or what right i remember in middle school science class we like looked at flatworms. It was part of our really? like, our, our paramecium. Oh, well, okay, that makes like sense. unit and all that, and you could like actually cut. It was like this whole thing where you can cut a flatworm in half, and then it'll just become two flatworms. Mm, yeah, some and, can do that. Uh, is this? Um, uh, but I remember these being like very small. Is the oceanic ones? Are they like bigger? Yeah, right. So I'll back up a little bit. Um, actually, some flatworms are. They must not all be able to do the regeneration thing because um, some types of flatworms are really hard to study because they are so fragile mm. and they just break apart when people are handling them. You step on them once and they just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even function like a carpet at all, turns out. Um, yeah, they just disintegrate when people are working with them, which makes me think they don't just immediately become right. multiple flatworms like that easily. One type of flatworm or like very... Um... 
primitive is like a bad word these days, but like, oh, yeah. kind of like a basic one that is just like a very simple structure. There are more simpler and more complex types yeah. of flatworms. Okay, so flatworm is an entire phylum. You'll notice over the course of weeks we're like starting to get our taxonomy <laughs> in order. <laughs> to use these words. I never actually <laughs> take the time just to study that chart. Um, all right, it's a whole phylum. There are about 25,000 species of flatworm. Um, and there are marine ones, freshwater ones, and terrestrial ones. They are found just about anywhere that it's wet. Um, mm. In the entire world, it said, so maybe there are incredibly extreme cold ones. I don't know. They're not in dry places, but they're in anywhere that's kind of damp. So maybe even like a damp, moldy pile of leaves, you're going to find them. Um, mm. They include probably the most familiar to all of us, tapeworms. Okay. Um, and 80% of all flatworms are parasites. Um, marine flatworms are not. They're part of the smaller percentage of flatworms that are free living, it's called, which means what it sounds like. They don't need a host. Um, okay, they are bilateral, invertebrates. Oh, this is probably out of order. They're bilateral acelomates. They're invertebrates. Acelomates. I think I'm pronouncing that right. A-C-O-E-L-O-M-A-T-E-S. Um, that means they have no body cavity, which is obvious when you look at one because they are... They're so Just they're flat fucking worm. flat. Yeah, <laughs> they're a very flat worm. So like, but they're how... like a spread. It's like if you took a worm, unsegmented it. So they're these are unsegmented. They're just like a single right cohesive piece, and then you flattened it. Like you put a rolling pin over it. But like how <laughs> how flat are they in terms of like millimeters thick? Do you know? Oh, Versus shit. like how like wide they are or long they are. Like what are the proportions? very flat. Versus very rolled out. They're like okay, their but, thin piece of dough. <laughs> but like, what what is what is I like a, what is like density. a large what is the, like a large flat one? Like okay. how long? Four inches. That's as big as they get. That's like a monster flat. Okay. Worm. Yeah. That's four inches long. They're, I was imagining like a C than... flat worm that was like eight feet long or something. Oh no! But no. I that would be actually probably be really cool. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking about one a, like decoratively, yeah, yeah, like draped over something. Yeah, so four inches is not a very big rug. It'd be like a dollhouse. You'd rug. need a lot of them. Okay, I don't know how deep they are. Is that the right word? Um, they could they can get about three to four inches in length, and those are the really really big species of marine ones only. Um, so all the freshwater ones, all terrestrial ones, um, and like. Terrestrial being an interesting thought because obviously, like a tapeworm can live inside of another animal. So right. I guess it's not really some I think are on like outside of bodies on the ground on bodies right. of other things or plants or something. But a lot of them are like inside, like they're foodborne. Some a lot sort of, time. of juice, whether it be like stomach acid or yeah. salt water or fresh water or bog water. Yeah, or like secretion feces feces water. probably oh definitely yeah probably i mean definitely. that's how that i understand that's i think how people get tapeworms a lot and it's a lot of them are food born that i know of maybe okay. through feces through like no maybe it's pinworms there's to. some sort of worm where if you step on feces without shoes on which if you I've ever wonder why yeah. you shouldn't do that <laughs> um you get some sort of worm that like burrows through your foot and then, like, travels up to your, like, digestive system. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I haven't heard of that. Maybe, maybe this. I think that, that maybe thing. like, an Amish country urban legend from where I grew up. Um, okay. Put a pin in pinworms. Put a pin in pinworms. Check we'll come that back out. To them. <laughs> Don't listen to us. Just wear <laughs> shoes if you're going to walk through fecal fields. Ew. Or like anywhere with a dog, because that's the kind of poop I've stepped in before in bare feet. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Um, here is the anatomy of a flatworm. Uh, it has no circulatory or respiratory organs. So all all living animals need oxygen, right? Oxygen passes through them by diffusion, right. which is the movement of something through anything else from a higher to a lower concentration. Right. So they basically take in concentrated oxygen and diffuse it out as lower oxygen. My brain kind of went off on the little like left side 
vein and was like, oh, I wonder if anything benefits from that. Like, is there some organism that needs diffused oxygen because of tapeworms? I don't know. I didn't find the answer to that. Right. Well, it's like, that's the way like a single celled organism works. It doesn't need, um, well, obviously it can't have a circulatory system, but it's just like it works by diffusion. Yeah. So like these animals, even though they're four inches long, they function the same way where they don't need a circulatory system because they're so flat. They're like they don't oxygen can just like pass can just pass through from the outside like light to shining through a stained all glass parts window of it. yeah exactly <laughs> um, they do have a central nervous system and they have a very simple brain which controls muscular movement um, okay the marine flatworms are called polycladia that's their order they are free living so they're non parasitic um, they move around on their own and they are predatory. They live wow. in the littoral and sublittoral zones. What is that? Right. I love when an animal doesn't have that much interesting about it because it's as simple as this flatworm is. <laughs> so I learned something else about the ocean. <laughs> um, the littoral zone is anything near shorelines. And the sublittoral zone is also known as the neuritic zone. It is the shallow zone of water above the drop off of a continental shelf. Okay. So when the shallow goes out to a certain point, there's usually a drop off where yeah. it gets much deeper, and the sublittoral zone is that area. Okay. Um, so uh, that's different than zone. like coastal zones. I don't know. Is if it's it's kind of like littoral just just, like, just means coastal or shore or. Or if that's near. more like a scientific term, coastal is kind of more like. Um, Colloquial. Lay speech. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, so that's where they live, and they're all over the place. Um, and they range in size from absolutely tiny to the huge ones, which are typically the ones that are very colorful and living in coral reefs. And so we don't, we're not aware of them much of the time because all the ones that are in your normal, like if you go swimming in New Jersey, um, you're not going to see them. They're just they're pretty little, and they're hiding out, and they don't like sunlight. Um, so they kind of burrow in the sand or they're living places with crevices or whatever. Mm. Um, the only ones that really spend time flashing around in the sun, um, are these big colorful coral reef living ones. And I will get to those. They're the ones that I kind of focused on because they're the ones that if you look them up on YouTube, you can watch videos of them swimming around for a long time because it's really mesmerizing. Um... I want to keep sort of an order here. Uh, their hunting habits, they, uh, well, I'll jump ahead for a second. So there are two types within the order of polycladia. There are acotilia and cotilia. So like a cotilia and cotilia. Um, the acotilia, um, they're, they are more dull colored, browns and grays. They're the ones we don't really see. They don't like light. They're major predators of bivalves. So oysters and clams and mussels and then the cotillia are very colorful they're more tropical um they're the ones that are super fragile uh, and their food it includes some bivalves but also other worms uh like sea worms maybe segmented worms i'm not sure protozoa and bryozoan which is an animal that basically looks like moss it's said Hmm. You know, it looks like a plant. It's mistaken for a plant all the time. It's like an algae or something, maybe. I think it looks like, like it, but it yeah. but it is by definition somehow. It lives in like big clumps, okay, like spread out flat clumps. Okay, <laughs> mass <out> flat clumps. <laughs> and eaten it, by rugs. And it's <laughs> eaten by <laughs> rugs. Um, they basically like are the same shape as this food that they're eating. So like how? So they have some sort of digestive tract, or like they have like a. I'm trying to imagine like what their mouth looks like. Oh, Do they I, have teeth? I can tell you. Ooh, it's strange. Uh, no, they don't. Um, but their mouths, their their mouths are an opening on their underside, and they have a pharynx, which is a, a an area of the throat that we all have, a muscle that's um, sort of above where the larynx is, and below where the uvula is. It's that area, right? I'm making it. <laughs> with the back of my tongue um their pharynx extrudes from their body like it comes out through the hole oh, or the alien. mouth and it envelops the prey and then 
it secretes a juice which totally liquefies it, and then they what? suck it back in. Dude, that is like alien. They do digest them because oh, maybe that's where they got that idea. Or there's probably a few animals that do this. I but... feel like I've seen like prehistoric, like drawings of prehistoric animals that kind of have this like other appendage that comes out of their mouth that they like eat with. These are definitely prehistoric. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. They, I mean, as as a it's as really a simple as they are, they're probably one of the earlier things to have developed. Yeah. It's just so terrible. Like uh, we obviously are not under threat by being eaten by flatworms, but just to imagine like this mechanism of this like other just like this like appendage coming out of a horrifying mouth, thing and it just, just like dissolves you. Dissolves you. Ugh, it's awful. Ah, right. Um. Yeah. And, and they they suck it back in. And they do all these marine. Um. I keep forgetting the word. The polycladia, they do have a very simple digestive tract. And this differentiates them from other types of flatworms, which don't. Okay. Obviously, if you're a parasite, you don't need to be, like, taking food, digesting it, and then taking in food again. Yeah. Um, but, anyway, um, they, they then get rid of the waste, the excrement, back through the same opening. Ah. So, <laughs> they basically spit out the parts they don't need. Wow. <laughs> they do not have... <laughs> they don't have another hole. They've got one, one hole. hole in and out. Goes in and out. Mm-hmm. Um, they have very basic eyes. What is the term for this? Ocelli. Very Ocelli. simple eyes. Uh, they're little flat kind of discs that may or may not be even noticeable, depending on the one you're looking at. They can't really see the way we think about seeing. Like uh, they can detect like movement and they can detect light. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and that's either to take advantage of light, which um, these cotillia do, the really colorful ones, or to avoid light. Taking advantage of light uh, is for um, one of the, the one of the reasons they guess they might do it is to flash their colors uh, to advertise their toxicity to fish that might eat them. Okay, so they are toxic. Some are. Hmm. The colorful ones are. That's how it always works. Right. In the non-mammal world, right? Or, like, the non-bird and mammal world. Like, if you're really colorful, you're probably totally poisonous. Yeah, right. Um, and the colors really are just insane. Um, there was one other thing I wrote about why um, they might be colored. I'm not seeing it in my notes, though. Maybe I'll rediscover it. Uh, yeah. I mean, no, but, you know, you wonder why they can't just hide. You know, and right. but they're they're swimming around advertising their toxicity, and they really do swim in pretty open water. Um, so I can't tell what they're doing exactly. I mean, they must it, be just be looking for. I get. Or maybe they're sucking up plankton the when they're doing that, yeah. or something like that. But you see these videos of them not really even near the ocean floor. It looks like a lot of work. They're kind of like yeah, folding themselves like in half and propelling around. them along. Yeah. And they're just kind of like, Probably they look very ends. affected by the current. <laughs> <laughs> it's either really easy. They're like birds kind of sailing and flopping, flapping. Yeah. Um, or, or it's taking them a lot of energy. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but this is, this is why many of them are colored. It also might be for camouflage, but those, those kind of work mm. in totally opposite Right. Right, you know, Either like like look at me. Or advertising like... <laughs> yourself or you're trying to blend in with um, a bunch of clownfish. Yeah. Sea stars. Here's a cool thing. Um they think the color might be due to the prey that they've eaten literally showing through them. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, here's the coolest part about them. Again, these are not all flatworms. These are specifically these marine uh kind of more advanced giant four inch flatworms they their reproduction this is what i want to talk about um specifically their sexual habits um they are hermaphroditic which means all of them um carry sperm and all of them have the potential to lay eggs uh but they engage in something regularly called penis fencing <laughs> Okay. And mostly, if, I have you, an image. if you look up flat, like marine flatworms, once you get past like the, the Wikipedia page, a lot of the other articles. It's about penis. It's fencing. just like penis fencing. Flat penis fencing. Okay, so penis fencing is a duel in which each, I gathered that. <laughs> in which each flatworm 
uh, during copulation, well, they don't really copulate. Um, what their copulation is, each of them are trying to impregnate the other one, and they have a little needle penis, which I don't know where that comes from. Like, yeah. it, they How have flat this, is that? Maybe it comes out of the hole also with the pharynx. And <laughs> it's, it's like a Swiss army knife. Yeah, before. like, like a, and um, they're, they're trying to impregnate the other one, and the loser, in quotes, has to play the role of the female of developing the eggs. Oof. But oh. in a lot of obs- deep, a it? lot of observation <laughs> of this because there's not a hole that it the pe- the little needle penis needs to go in, all they're doing is stabbing each other anywhere. So like if you look at my hand and think of it as a flatworm, you could it, like anywhere you get poked impregnates you. It sends oh. sperm. Wow. So most of the time they say both of them end up stabbing each other, so they just both end up they both carrying just end up eggs, pregnant. Which probably is good for the species, but Right. Um, it's called hypodermic impregnation. Just like pregnant through the skin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Poke a bunch of holes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and let's see, then, uh, about, so they say when one is first poked, uh, it's covered in these white streaks, which is the sperm. Yeah. And then about over the course of like a day that absorbs into them. Wow. Can uh, they impregnate themselves? Body. Can no. they poke themselves? They cannot poke themselves. I wonder if there's any animals... That self... That self... We, like these hermaphroditic animals, like the lobster, can be a hermaphrodite, but right. it can't reproduce with itself. Hmm. Uh, I know, like, the the Komodo dragon. Isn't this possible? What? Yeah. No. I, no I swear. I, I have a really distinct memory of this, because they were these species that would swim up to islands. And so sometimes it would just be like the only Komodo dragon, only one made it to this island. And so they evolved this process where they can like impregnate themselves and make a clone of themselves. So well, like, every other animal has just died out when it ended up alone on an island. Yeah. But Komodo dragon's like, nope. We need a fact checker. Make... Well, <laughs> we need I know. someone to hang out <laughs> I know, with us. Because this is so tempting to just like <laughs> Cross pollinate, like, yeah, like, like facts and just facts. Like, <laughs> um, okay, so I just they... hear David Attenborough's voice in like my bicameral region of my mind, just like whispering incorrect facts information that at you. Maybe true. I I see David Attenborough just like dropping his head into his palm when we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> if he ever listens to this, like, oh, gosh. yeah, that head smack. Okay, so they they um, they lay eggs. Um, about 18 days, they oviposit, just like the seahorses do, okay. a clutch of eggs, and it's very spread out. Um, I read this one really specific thing, they were like, they, they've been observed loving, laying a couple rounds of eggs, numbering somewhere up to a thousand, all next to each other, so they like spread out a clutch, and then they spread out another clutch, and they spread out another clutch, and it mm. forms this sort of little field, and then the last one, they put on top. <laughs> 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 Which, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this is still a very little field, though, I suppose. With this very particular. Maybe four inch big. Yeah. Um, and then they spread themselves out on top of the clutch um, for a variety of time, depending on the species. Um, and they wait for the eggs to hatch. So they kind of just like, they just lay on them. It's like octopuses. It's, it's like birds. Of, I mean, it's kind of the same settle thing. Settle down with the eggs. But this is really like, they're, they like are super a blanket. Mm, wow. They fulfill their their destiny. <laughs> Yeah, to just become a to rug. To just be a rug. <laughs> it's really... Covering something up under their rug. They're so pretty. Um, most of what I did during our research time before this one is draw one of these and then color it. I learned that... It's very beautiful. I have thanks. It's hot pink, a sort of burgundy, a yellow, and um, this like bluish greenish marker which in the picture that I was copying it was black but I didn't have a black marker. I learned yeah. that I am out of practice coloring. I have not colored mm. in a very long Coloring's time. Coloring is not easy. It's not easy. It was as meditative as they say it is. You know, like remember this phase that started in the past 10 years where they saw these coloring books of like everything. Mm. But I had a more satisfying time drawing my wiggly. It was actually kind of hard like to get the uh, the perspective of this. Yeah, it's very hard. It's, like, it's so floppy. And like, how do you catch like these undulating to... rolls yeah. and stuff? Yeah, yeah, I definitely had to copy it. Couldn't have done this just from my own imagination. But High level perspective. That's the marine coral flatworm. Cool. Well, boy, I never knew. I never knew. I never knew they were so 
flat. <laughs> They're very flat. <laughs> this other website that I came across, which is like marine biology for kids, it was like um they're flat and it just <laughs> it was written in kind of a funny way and it was like there's not a ton you need to know about these like as far as like what a, the kid needs to be able to know they're yeah. just like they're just they're really like if you think about an animal and you're like it's a pretty flat animal but then you're like thinking of it there's a little part of it that there's something else going on and there's a little bit of roundness or yeah they're like they're not they yeah. are they are just like they're totally flat right like paper flat so I just like when I hear about an animal like this, not that I'm not impressed, but I just <laughs> careful what you say. <laughs> like there are some animals that are very obviously like critical to a food chain or a food web. If it's really obvious, if you take this animal out, like if you take out all the sperm whales, we're just going to be overrun with giant squid. They're right. just going to be crawling. They're going to be grabbing the us beaches. off of our boats with their tentacles. <laughs> just up through the toilets. <laughs> And I just went, like, if you took a flatworm away, like, what would happen to, like, an ecology? Would it just become overrun with, like, this sea moss algae? Maybe. Or, I mean, they are, they eat a lot of mollusks. Or what eat eats them? Fish. Okay. I don't have anything more specific than that. Obviously, they're trying not to be eaten by... Right, they're, if they're, they're like thing, this or toxic, toxic thing. thing. I'm sure there's some fish that there's is, always one that's fish that's like to be like right, the right, right, or right to like have an antivenom yeah. that it de- like deactivates the flatworm with or something. Right. I mean, everything you can assume is playing some role that it's hard to understand. They, I, I, sh- I should have mentioned this other like one category that we always tend to hit, um, which is like predation by us or us fucking up them or whatever there doesn't seem to be much of that other than like just generic coastline degradation right and this is like habitat ruin um but they are in no way a suffering (laughs) or endangered species at all (laughs) i don't know i mean there are some animals like a human tapeworm that well sorry like a tapeworm that a human could get from eating food or like a flea where i'm really kind of lost as to how anything else how they would are suffer essential. without it yeah, yeah i don't know what right. eats those you know but they're just there they're, they're, right. they're like they're like what are like totally just like why is that a thing? Right. Right, right right yeah but these these ones that hunt they're part of you know the food chain in a few probably really important ways right well i'm not going to eliminate them i'm just curious they're so fun to watch swim yeah, they're if so... nothing else, they're beautiful to watch swim. Even your mom this morning, <laughs> who's normally like, ew, about everything, <laughs> she was like, huh. Oh. It's really... It's really pretty. They're like very... They're very... Yeah. She thinks a lot of things are pretty as long as they're not a moth. Well, yeah, she's not super into like worms and... No. Like a lot of... <laughs> she likes these. <laughs> they're the prettiest worm out there. <laughs> Um, cool. Okay. Oh, gosh. So, I know. It's a little tough. Uh, so I researched the bluefin tuna, mm. which is a really fascinating creature and um, is really kind of like ground zero for the whole um, we are overeating the oceans. My epidemic. immediate question that I comes to mind is like, why do we only see yellowfin tuna on sushi menus? Okay. Are we too I'll poor to eat bluefin tuna? <laughs> uh, pretty much because the bluefin tuna are like near extinction. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll get into that's a big part of it. But first, just some, some basic facts. Oh man, um, this is going to ruin sushi for me. For yeah, it really is. We shouldn't eat sushi. It's a spoiler alert. Um, so there's the Atlantic population the Pacific population, and the Southern population. And these are all considered individual species of the bluefin tuna. Okay. Um, And there also is, um, historically, a Mediterranean population and even a Black Sea population. The Black Sea bluefin tuna has gone extinct to overfishing, and the Mediterranean is uh, getting pretty close. Um, They are... Like, it was, since we eat so much of them out of a little can, we kind of, like, I found myself kind of, like, grouping them in, like, kind of subconsciously. With all the other canned fish? Yeah, to, like, herring. like a like a herring. Sardines. Or, like, a mackerel or a sardine or an anchovy or something like this. 
But, I mean, these fish are all, like, pretty small. But, like, a tuna is massive. I mean, fully grown, they're 8 to 10 feet long. Wow. The largest one wow. we caught was 12, foot, 12 feet long. I kind of were imagining them, like, a 4-foot size. I, I mean, knew they were big, but... There, there's a whole range, and they they grow actually very slow. They can live up to like fifty years, mm. and uh, but they grow actually. I said I just said they grow slowly. They grow pretty fast at first, and then they kind of like reach a, a cruising size, and then kind of like, grow slowly after that. Okay. Um, and they can weigh up to fifteen hundred pounds, and they are, only in rival to the marlin and the swordfish. As the largest persiform, which, since we're trying to get our taxonomy, Oop. a persiform is a is a order or super order uh-huh. yeah. of ray finned fish. So it's like a, bar, a large grouping of bony fish. So yeah. it's separate from um, fish with cartilage. Um, but they're so they're pretty much like the largest fish in this um, category, and they're only natural predators other than humans, when they're adults, are orcas. Uh, sea lions? Seals? No. Sea lions. No. They're too big for sea lions and seals. Yeah, they're like 12 feet long. A sea lion is like, I don't know how big they are, but I think a bluefin tuna is like bigger than a sea lion. Okay. Well, maybe there's another type of tuna that's smaller. I have this really distinct memory. I mean, there are, there are many different types of tuna. Yeah. And they can be like, if they're smaller tuna, like younger in age... Or, like, they just spawn. I'm sure they're eaten by all kinds of things. Well, I have this like memory of, like, things. a really cool chase scene in one of the planet Earth or lives or whatever of, like, mm. seals or sea lions. I think it was sea lions hunting, like, cornering a school of tuna in a cove and then okay. like going at them. Yeah. I mean, that may be possible. Um, I think they were probably juvenile tuna. Okay. Or let's just, okay. Because they kind of have a whole, like, life cycle and they're, like, they spawn um, in certain areas and travel to other areas and uh, yeah, yeah so and large sharks large like oceanic sharks and um it also said very large billfish which a billfish is like a marlin or a swordfish but that's also kind of confusing because they also like are as big as these creatures right yeah so i don't really know um i guess though there there's some mammal equivalents of yeah that's oh, true. an animal eating another animal besides, yeah. or maybe they had to do it in a group like a few marlins right too. right right or if it's like like kind of feeding frenzy and they're already kind of being right ground to bits um but but <laughs> ground to bits that's um, what we do to them putting them in the can yeah it's true but uh they dive to 3300 feet and they eat um sardines and herring and mackerel and squid nice and mollusks so oh okay yeah um or crustaceans I should say. Yeah, those are different. Yeah, they don't eat mollusks. <laughs> I think I just made that up. <laughs> um, David! <laughs> um, so they're very high in the food chain, um, which I'll get into this a bit more in the, in the culinary aspect of them, but this is what makes them have a very high level of mercury, is that they're just eating all these littler fish, and they live for so long, like up to 50 years, and they have, like, really voracious appetites and really high metabolism. Um, why does that accumulate? Mercury? Because they just eat a lot of small fish. And why and do small fish, why are they full of mercury? There's just kind of, like, traces of mercury all throughout the ocean. And it's, like, all the way up through the food chain. But if you, like, eat a small fish, even though you, like, digest the fish and um, spit out the rest of the bits, like, uh, like um, mercury is kind of like filtered out and stored in your organs or in like your body fat. Wow. Um, so like if you think of it, that if you eat a fish, like you store whatever mercury is in that fish within you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they eat just a and lot. And they just eat so much fish. fish. Yeah. And um, they're really fast, right? They're very fast. They swim up to 43 miles an hour. Damn. <laughs> like what is an average, insane. like what's an average speedboat speed? Do you know? I'm not sure. Okay, I'm 43 miles an hour on the water is very fast. I know. Well, I'm thinking about the time that I jet skied and getting the thing up to close to 50 was, it felt, I mean, but that's harder to tell. 50 compared miles to what an boat. hour was crazy. It was crazy. Um, it didn't feel safe. It was very fun. Speed boat speed. 
So I travel 43 miles an hour in bursts. Ugh, everything is always said in knots. I, I know. The <laughs> knots thing. We need um, to do a whole episode on M-P-H. like knots. We need to do just an episode on like measurements and terminology yeah, of water stuff. Yeah, a nautical mile and a knot. <laughs> 90 miles per hour. As fast as 90 miles an hour. A speed boat. Average speed. Um, okay, whatever. We'll move on from this, but... That's as fa- like fastest, 90 miles an hour, I mean. Yeah. So, um, and they travel up to 5,000 miles in their migration. So, they're fish that move. Um, all tunas are warm-blooded. Uh, but, the, <laughs> but the bluefin <laughs> tuna so crazy. has really advanced systems to kind of thermoregulate their body temperature. Um, so, they have striated livers which are they're just like the livers are just covered in, in blood vessels to keep them warm and um, they have one of the highest blood to hemoglobin concentrations among any fish mm. which hemoglobin is how you oxygenate your, yeah uh, carry oxygen around your body um, they have counter current blood exchange which means that like their blood which is traveling like to their heart or away from their heart they run parallel but in opposite directions so they're like right next to each other and this has been like mimicked in um industry um for like the the most efficient way to kind of like regulate and not lose energy within like a system okay wait trying to regulate so temperature within a vein there's blood going one way and blood going another way no just two veins right next to each other okay so one direction is like hot and the and the other direction is cold moving in the opposite direction oh and somehow this exchange kind of um so there's hot blood and cold blood going through yeah well i mean the blood that's always going away from your heart is hot and then when it comes back to your heart it's it's cool yeah and um so and this like really helps them to stay stay regulated stable and um and they're just like such athletic active fish that are just like eating all the time and uh their body remains stiff even while they're swimming so like their tail will move really fast but their body will stay like really rigid Mm. which is kind of rare is that because of all the blood uh it's kind of the way they're just like very uh muscled and like very kind of uh they're just kind of like built to swim. <laughs> like those bodybuilder really guys. Yeah. Who just kind of look stuck into the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like they're very, I mean, you watch videos of them, they're so agile and like so fast. Yeah. Um, they're always in groups, right? Pretty yeah. Big groups. Yeah, they have schools. Okay, I already did that. <laughs> You're avoiding getting to the sad part, but I know, he's I know. like scrounging <laughs> for more cool facts. More cool before. facts. <laughs> okay. <sighs> okay, I'm going into it. Okay. Fishing. So by 1000 AD, sophisticated fisheries have popped up in the Mediterranean um, that were harvesting bluefin tuna. And those have all pretty much completely collapsed. Uh, But interestingly enough, um, after World War II, the like kind of the international fishing trade kind of really amped up. And it's from like the technology of canning fish. Mm -hmm. And, um, And Japan after World War II kind of one of their main economies became exporting fish and but at the time um people didn't really value bluefin tuna for food so there was kind of like a sport fishing craze going on in like nova scotia where like the biggest bluefin tuna are um but they would just catch these like 12 foot bluefin tuna and take a picture of them and then like throw them away because wow. they weren't valued at all for food um which is interesting they everybody ate yellowfin tuna I wonder if they taste that different. Um, I mean, well, now it's kind of like this extreme delicacy, but like whether that means they taste better or not. um, Yeah, who's to say with delicacies? Exactly. Um, And uh, the Japanese did not eat uh, bluefin tuna. I think they're fattier than uh, yellowfin tuna. Um, But it said one of the theories for like the developing a taste for it was that the U.S. occupation during World War II just introduced a lot of like really fatty meat like beef to the Japanese culinary culture and this kind of prepared them to be like okay this bluefin tuna is like really fatty and like the belly got of the it, goods otoro as it's called is um was just became to be really sought after um so people started fishing bluefin tuna and um they're 
kind of like one of the main ways they would start they really did it on mass was drift nets which are i'm going to go into a little bit i'm going to try to fly over briefly uh, the six different types of ocean fishing because it's kind of <laughs> it's important to understand like how this is happening yeah. to fish um so the drift net um, which is kind of the worst thing. You just like lay off this giant carpet onto the ocean and just yeah, haul just everything. Yeah, catch in. whatever comes and, it's and hope totally for it. totally indiscriminate. Um, the bycatch, as it's called, uh, catching the things that you're not looking for, um, is just huge. And But that has been banned since the 1990s, which I thought it was earlier than that. But um, So that's by far the worst. Ah, I um, remember it happening in Free Willy. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if that was illegal. Well, then, that... But... Um, Drift net that might have been um, a purse sign. Okay. Purse sign, purse sign. I'll get into that in a second. Um, long line, which is just like you have a string going out into the ocean with a bunch of hooks with meat on it, um, accounts for ten percent of the tuna we eat. Uh, it has a twenty percent bycatch, which is not very good. And um, yeah, that's still so much. Yeah, it uses one thousand. 70 liters of fuel for one ton of tuna. Um, what, like the boat hauling it back? Yeah. Just okay. like the amount of energy for a boat it takes to catch one ton of tuna is about 1,070. Um, pole and line, which is the one that you always see like on the on the tuna cans. Um, well, that, like the... <laughs> it says like, like the, pole and line caught. Yeah, and this yeah, is supposed like to be the better. like the more expensive tuna cans yeah, have a like a yeah. quaint little fisherman on the exactly. <laughs> on the label. Yeah, with a, like a little yellow hat. Um, this accounts for only eight percent of the tuna that's consumed worldwide. Um, this is, yeah, this is real. Like they're, yeah. they're hauling up ten foot long tuna with a fishing pole. I mean, it's they'll have like. A bunch of poles on a ship. They, they do it at kind of like a commercial rate, but mm. yeah. Wow, and then they've got like, um, a, like a pulley system to reel it in. Yeah, and this does reduce the bycatch. Um, it's not zero, but it, it does reduce it a lot. Well, no fishing. You're you're gonna guarantee you're only exactly. gonna get the species of fish that you're going for. Exactly. Um, but this um, this method uses one thousand four hundred eighty five liters of fuel for one ton caught. So it's almost like a fifty percent increase. Is that because they have to spend more time out there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and from like an environmental perspective, you need to like hold into account like, okay, the bycatch is less, but you use a lot more fuel, which is not good. Um, <laughs> no good way. The troll, <laughs> which is, uh, it's really similar to pole and line from what I can understand. It just looks like this one big like central column with like a bunch of lines going off of it. Okay. Um, um, this has also minimal bycatch, um, but it uses 1,107 liters of fuel per ton, per ton of food caught. Um, so it's a little bit better than pole and line. They're all, they are, are all somewhere in the thousand. Yeah. Like they're sounding all pretty similar. Yeah. So. Um, the gill net, uh, which is, um, use kind of more like small operations like kind of coastal communities especially in asia and india um that kind of like subsistence fishermen yeah like living off the water use gill nets and um the one benefit these all kind of have like a benefit and a drawback and the one benefit of a gill net is it lets smaller more juvenile fish pass through the gill net which is kind of like is a that what it's called that yeah i think they like pass through and then like part of their body can go through uh, but they're they're too fat to get all the way through, so then they try to pull back, and then they get caught on their gills. Mm. Um, yeah, um, but this is really bad for sharks and turtle, and by far the biggest one is the purse, S E I N E purse sign, purse sign, purse sign, yeah, yeah purse scene. Never heard. Um, and this is I think what you saw in Free Willy, which is like this big net that they make a circle out of, oh, okay. and it's used to catch like a school of fish. Yeah. And um, that accounts for 66% of the tuna we eat. Um, and the, like, there are benefits to it. Like the bycatch is actually, when you use it just on like a free swimming school of fish, it can be really little bycatch because mm-hmm. it's just literally the school of fish. And it doesn't sit out all night where like a turtle and a dolphin is going to get mixed up in it. Um, but sometimes they use bait 
fraught bait, which just attracts a lot of other animals. And this can be up to like about 10% bycatch when they do this. But um, it only uses 368 liters of fuel for one ton of food caught. Um, okay. But uh, so from so a they're fuel like, perspective. So they're going out. They're like, we see a school of fish. Yeah. We're going to it. Yeah. We're going back in. And then just like round it all up. Um, but it's kind of so efficient in catching so much fish. And it's completely indiscriminate whether they're juvenile or mature. Right. So it's not, it's been... not really controlling the population. So yeah. what they need. Yeah. Um, so even though it's kind of good in terms of fuel and bycatch, it's just depleting the fisheries so much. Um, um, so those are kind of the six ways. The fisheries. So are they a fishery, growing I think... tuna? What's that? Are people growing tuna? Yeah, all? so aquaculture, uh, which just started in the 1970s, which like farmed fish is something you always kind of see. And like there's kind of like this intuitive thing that you believe that because they're not like taking on the wild population, maybe this is more sustainable, but it's kind of even worse. Um, I don't know, because a lot of cans or packaging is advertising wild caught. Right. As if it's that's because, a better thing. Well, farm fish is actually a lot worse. And um, yeah. the reasons are that most of the time um, they just catch juvenile fish in the wild and put them into these farms because they can't get fish to reproduce in the farms because they have to travel to their spawning grounds. Yeah, right. They have. They, um, so there's they no reproduction going on. And so they just like catch all these fish. So all these fish have no chance to reproduce in their life cycle and then just like grow up in these farms. But it's and, true, like, when you think, when you hear, or when you read Wild Caught, you're like, your mind goes to that guy with a pole. And it's like, that's not really yeah, what's happening not what either. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's all kind of like a veil um, into actually what's you're going like, on. You're like, no, it's, it's just Paul with the hat <laughs> and the raincoat <laughs> and his wellies. It's very cold. He yeah, and he took it to his hut afterward and hung it up. <laughs> Um, so this is actually has been the most serious threat to the entire fishing population is these aquacultures because oh. they just don't allow fish to reproduce. So right, it's just like totally short circuiting, um, the entire life cycle. And, um, and they kind of have to raise them for like several years before they can really go to market and they have to feed on average 10 pounds of fish to get one pound of tuna. No, it's like the cow industry. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, the beef it's industry. just like so. Like a lot of times, that salmon. So they feed ten pounds of salmon to get one pound of tuna. And then, meanwhile, which, we're eating salmon at a higher yeah rate per exactly. <laughs> or cost um, per like fish. Then I didn't even really go into salmon. That's whew, that's going to be another depressing one, I think. Um, and just a statistic: in 2010, 30 million tons of fish were caught just to feed fisheries. So that's not even to tuna, feed us. bluefin tuna. Um, just like fisheries in general. Oh, like I see. Okay. Farmed fish. Um, Fuck. Yeah, which is not good. And these farm markets have everything really... is going on on a scale that it is really hard um, to, to grasp. To grasp, and then to remind yourself of. It's like not a piece of information that we can hold on to with like regularity or with yeah. c- constant consistency. Yeah, like it's so because you just can't you can't live your day to day life with this weight of knowledge of like the magnitude of everything disastrous. Yeah. <laughs> All it's stuff. Really, and it's I mean, just or like you can, I mean, 30 like, million, I guess people who 30 million really tons of fish, this, like do what does that even mean or look right, like? I mean, right, it, right. it just like, becomes this like number that's like, Oh my God. And then yeah. I'm going to make a can of tuna tomorrow. I know. Maybe I won't. Right. Yeah. It's wild caught. Um, well, we do buy the pole guy version. Yeah. From whole foods. So. I mean, it, it, it always just seems like it's either the pole one or like the net one. And, like, to me, like, growing up, it's always, like, the nets are where they catch the dolphins, so, like, the pole ones are better. And for dolphins, the pole ones are definitely better. But you gotta they're not, pick and choose. they're not very efficient in terms of, Gas. like, <laughs> flooding the oceans with, like, diesel exhaust and stuff, so. Um, so these farm markets have really popped up, these fish farms, up in North Africa and the Mediterranean and Australia, um, these places where, like, the natural, like, the wild populations have collapsed. And, um then these like really kind of like flooded the markets with fish and then like depressed the prices. And then this caused fishermen to like, kind of like have to increase or like double their catch to balance their sheets. Yeah. And it's and just that's just like totally total accelerated this, this cycle of overfishing. Um, and 
at that result, the bluefin tuna is now an endangered species. Um, but it's still caught and sold and eaten. Um, in 2019, a 618-pound Pacific bluefin tuna sold at a Tokyo fish market for $3.1 million, which comes out to $5,000 per pound. I don't even know what to say to that. I know. $5,000 per pound. You go to the grocery store and it's like per pound, it's like $15 is like what you pay for like a processed fish at a grocery store. And this is $5,000 per pound for the whole fish. Why though? Uh, because they're like really rare and like you can't really get them to eat anymore because they're endangered and there's like all these bans on fishing them. So the ones that, that do. That is such a load of money to, to drop on such yeah. a temporal thing. It's all... I mean, I guess it's the equivalent if you're that rich of being like, ooh, okay, I'll splurge $25 on a lobster roll today. Yeah, right. Um, but so I just looked up at the very end, it's my last bit. Um, kind of the oceanic society.org had kind of like tips for sustainable seafood of like what we shouldn't eat and what we should eat and part of like their whole <laughs> nothing yeah that Leave was pretty alone. much their whole thesis I'm was sure. like how should i eat seafood responsibly and it was like don't <laughs> so which is Fuck. kind of but um they had well, some... i wonder how a flatworm tastes could start out like a market for yeah. them. They'd probably fry up, they're probably be very thin. So, they're like, like a little <laughs> mucusy chip. Yeah, very really slimy. <laughs> uh, if you broil them, they just disappear though. No, it would take frying. Everything gross needs to be fried in order to be edible. It's true. Just um, deep frying. <laughs> so it said it had a list of don'ts. Number one on the list was bluefin tuna. So don't eat bluefin tuna. Would we even Even be able if to you paid $3.1 million dollars for a bluefin tuna, you shouldn't eat it. Um, Atlantic halibut. Um, eel, which is a really tough one for me. I thought eels weren't endangered, but this was on the top of the list of things you shouldn't eat. Oh. Which is really difficult. Um, an orange ruffy, which I, I didn't know what that I've was. I've actually heard that word before, but I never, I don't know what it looks like. Mm. An imported shrimp. Or yeah, like I've, five... I've heard this about shrimp. Get your yeah. shrimp from somewhere. Yeah. Like, we should get our shrimp from, like, Maryland and things like that. Right, right. Um, uh, but it said, if you are going to eat seafood, the best thing to do is eat stuff that's lower on the food chain. So, this is good for you. Oysters, mm. mussels. Domestic tilapia. Oh, is yeah. Is pretty good. Okay. Um, uh, catfish, which uh, I heard is, yeah, no. You know. You just fry it, you know. Well, it's, it's like big, a flat <laughs> um, Clams and sea urchins. Oh, I've my. never had a sea urchin. Who was talking about thinking sea urchins were like their favorite uh, seafood Tony, the other day? Anthony Bourdain. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I think we bring up Anthony Bourdain like once At least an once an episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that makes me want to try to eat a sea urchin. Um, uh, yeah, it's just like that's not on a lot of menus. I know. But, what um, kind of tuna are we getting in a normal can of tuna? Yellow that's yellowfin tuna. Yeah. Okay. And that's normally what you see in sushi restaurants and everything yeah. too. Are I, they if you ever go to a sushi restaurant and you're getting like a spicy tuna roll, that's yellowfin tuna. Right. And yeah. albacore and skipjack and all this stuff is all from a yellowfin tuna. Is that the, just... the, the, the cuts of meat yeah. essentially? Yeah. Right. Um, Oof, so that's tuna. that. Don't eat bluefin tuna. Try not to eat much of any tuna. It's really difficult if you love tuna melts like we do. Yeah, um, we eat tuna like a few times a week. I know. It's not good. Definitely don't feed it to your cat. Don't feed it to your cat. Maybe don't even have a cat. No, I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Go watch a YouTube video of a flatworm swimming. Yeah, I'll cheer you Lift up. your spirits right back up. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye. Yes, we need a dose of inspiration. This Leviathan and meditation set to me.